world striving striving to construct without waste and how to manage waste the construction process simultaneously made sure that the skilled workers and the tradesmen had uh, their self respect and uh, the dignity of the land was protected a, a work so didi contractor work in this regard is therefore very very pertinent i take this opportunity to opportunity to thank all the speakers who have been closely associated with didi contractor and have taken out their time to share their legacy i am sure all of us will benefit and enjoy the, the your presentations thank you very much and wish you all the best thank you sir uh, for encouraging us and for being with us uh, may i please request uh, professor rajesh ray to just give a brief uh, overview of what we are doing and put this talk in its context well the style project is uh, one of ah divisions research projects in tax uh, in tax uh, objective has one of the objectives have been uh, inventory has been in tax has been doing inventory for a long time and the inventory process is selective it has been selective it has been spread across the country also now as an extension of the inventory project we have decided to go on with one or two of the aspects of inventory to extend that into a larger research project so this one is on indian architecture the style of indian architecture so we want to sort of begin uh, putting up a database interconnecting all the existing resources knowledges that are there with individuals in various parts of the country institutions libraries and individuals who have done research in these areas so we have a three part uh three verticals in this one is what we call nature is mostly covering the what we are used to be calling vernacular architecture so far the second part is traditional architecture which is the second uh, element which is between uh, after vernacular architecture the entire range of historic buildings which are unprotected it covers that range and the third part we call ideology so nature culture and ideology and three verticals so they are interconnected and the areas in between them are not very sharp and gray but that's how we have put the project on so far and uh, we have as part of that uh, various things including this lecture series so we call in people who have experience in these areas and they have their own research and let them speak ask them to speak on uh, those aspects and we collect these information and get whatever is required for us in various uh, components of our research work and uh, so this is uh, going to be an ongoing open research and it's going to become further interactive down the line and we hope to go in public uh, in a few months time so we have this uh, program or event we'll have six speakers uh, who are connected to dd contractors life and work in different individual ways and uh, i will introduce them subsequently as and when they come to speak but we are starting with professor kt ravindran who as you know is an urban designer and a long standing friend of dd contractor he shared with dd contractor a deep commitment towards construction processes which simultaneously salvage the self respect of the skilled workers and the dignity of the land he has closely interacted with dd contractor for the last 35 years discussing responsible building ethics and the relevance of local practices in order to retrieve the deteriorating environment kt ravindran you must have seen in various platforms across the country over time but i'm sure we know that his heart actually lies here so i'll invite him to uh, start the event by talking about her and then i think he's going to show a small film subsequently kt sir thank you rajat for giving me the opportunity to speak on d uh, the outset i want to thank uh, the architectural heritage hall and dive and malvika and the whole team for having put this together in such a short time 
because we lost PD uh, as last week, and uh, it's the opportune moment to remember the contributions that she has made to not simply to the built environment, but even the manner in which uh, the construction processes are designed to bring about a sustainable system of building. So DD's work was uh, in fact uh, very unique from that perspective in the sense that uh, she was not uh, 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 she was not uh, copying vernacular she was not quote unquote inspired by vernacular the work that she was doing was actual vernacular processes so in her own opinion the building is only a symptom of a certain set of conditions and dd went about designing those conditions with care and concern which finally results in an aesthetic which is so unique and which is so completely embedded in the values of vernacular now i'll quickly read through nine issues that i had outlined as characteristics or qualities of vernacular all of them find resonance in dd contractors work so this is what makes dd contractor very unique in the sense that she was not a stylistic apologist she was someone who out of her deep concern for the well-being of the earth and out of her deep concern for uh, sustainable built environment a concern about the future of humanity she she put together a set of processes which finally results in an architecture which is so unique and so completely at peace with its own environment this is what made pd contractor very unique uh, i'll just very quickly go through the nine points i've written on the on the uh, characteristics of the vernacular building traditions first one is the materials are always sourced from the site and surroundings a co production process where everyone puts in their optimum skills building traditions as sourced from immediate environment or, the, or that the work is informed by from a, as a conceptual frame from the idea of the locality and uh, her structures were lean in the sense that there were no excesses and there was no waste the materials she used were of low embodied energy post construction engagement of continuing relationship between the building and the inhabitants that in in the way people take care of their homes was very much part of her building ethos she did not want to create permanent lifelong you know kind of indestructible monstrosities that we find around ourselves she built them using the earth she built them using the immediate environment and created uh, an architecture that is at once unique innovative and vernacular her architecture never challenged the environment it was not bound by any stylistic traditions but she had a continuity in the way she innovated in buildings she established continuity in innovation It sounds like an oxymoron but that's the exactly the kind of uh, uh, tightrope walk that she did in her work uh, she created continuities continuities out of innovations not on imitations and she her buildings had a harmonious presence in the natural environment and that harmony was the aesthetic that she created she did not attempt to stylistically uh, brand her buildings with her own ego but she created the kind of buildings which are harmonious with their own physical environment and that was the essence of her aesthetic then as always always new always in continuity and very very vernacular in essence she had a unique way of putting these processes together and that's what gave rise to this now i'll show you very quickly a 6 minute clip of uh, an interview with dd 
which was taken many years ago in Ghanbadi at a at a conference that she organized uh, for us called the Responsible Building Forum. Now, uh, this video has not been seen by anyone. It was sitting in two computers, and uh, I managed to excavate them. And we have the, now the film here. Uh, it was filmed by Vrinda Kanminde in 2014. And uh, it was by the courtesy of the, the Forum for Responsible Architecture that we are able to show this today. So Pinaki Roy, who, who helped me with it, is behind, is, gave me the permission to play this today. So for the first time, you can hear Didi talk about her own ideology. Which was on the quality of life, the quality of visual experience, the quality of a person's reaction with the environment and what inspires the soul. And I think that it's very important looking at the ugly because one of the things that distresses me is not just that they're ecologically bad, but they're ugly. That what's happening, and so the definition. And yesterday, Yogi was saying that many, um, um, uh, you, you know, we had to be able to change our ideas, but we also have to have some sort of a basis um, for the aesthetic for making aesthetic judgments. And that sort of common basis, which is like, say, the perennial philosophy in, in philosophical thought, there are some parameters that are covered by all the variations. And so I would like to break down, we have thought of three groupings, there are many other groupings that could take place, but I thought of three groupings. One was to discuss the dynamic symmetry and the different theories of um, aesthetic thing and how these have been incorporated by different cultures, working with the basically the same the geometry that nature works with, and studying that and how that then feeds into building. And that, that goes along with um, a whole um, concept of um, uh, what would be possible as a viable alternative in the future is one to me that is based more on nature's way of working, of the cyclical way of nature's working, and how that reflects into aesthetics. Then another topic that I thought we could break it into was the discussion of the inspiration from tradition and vernacular, because what I've seen is usually people, they, they take a little arch, just like as many of the Indian artists sort of take a little eye and put it in, and they superimpose it on a vision that is essentially not the same of, of integrity as the traditional, because the traditional things grew out of needs to express certain ideas or the sense of a certain forms of stability of different cultural and, and uh, emotional needs, because aesthetics to me is the covering of the emotional impact of the building. And this is, this is very important in, in it's how we change our attitudes toward, and it's what's <coughs> seen when you look at the outside, you sense them. Um, when Marsha McLuhan speaks of the, the medium as a message, you look at the media, of the visual media of, say, the new buildings that are around that are so essentially ugly. Why are they ugly? Why are people attracted to them? And what is the message behind that? Because, and, and when we're talking also about the, the uh, topics we were talking earlier, there's the fact that the somebody, you look at the question, who profits? And a lot of these things occur because of the corporates are going to profit. There's a certain, we've turned our, our whole philosophical thinking around into which anything that grows is good. And whereas growth beyond a certain point is um, a, in nature is cancers. There's, everything has its maturity. And there's a possibility of defining that maturity aesthetically. You see by the aesthetic Aesthetics are like the symptom that a patient's, it's very hard to express these ideas, they're complex. That aesthetics is the symptoms by which you see whether the patient is sick or well. The aesthetics are, are, are um, conducive to our, to the um, soft, the emotional, the, the um, inherent reaction that we have. And when these aesthetics are hard and harsh, like the reflective surfaces that, that blare against the eye or blare against the heart. They don't nurture. So the, the aesthetics of tradition nurtured, but, but we can't copy that. 
there's a way of going back and finding why those were arrived at, what sort of harmonies they uh, brought up. No? And then the third division that we had is modernity, as the, the, the new ways, because this uh, Bauhaus vision, they had an idea actually, that, if you, that the modern world allowed you to see life and nature in a different way, and that if we began to look in that way, we would advance in a, a, a whole change of outlook. And it didn't happen. Now we had World War II instead. And we have the horror now instead of the, the sort of commercialization of which everything is for profit and for growth, regardless it's against. I mean, very rightly yesterday we came to the sort of consensus, I think, completely that with everybody that something has to be favoring the growth of life, of well-being. And that it isn't. So to take a turn in that direction, I think one has to look underneath at the underlying aesthetic problems. So then this environment is my, to date, the best I can do, a statement of my own concerns in which I've taken utmost care with the geometry of each detail, trying to, to create a, a geometrical harmony. And I've taken a... a um, I haven't copied any details from our party architecture, but I've been studying the way in which it pleases me when I see it, and what was out, what processes in the artisan's work. <coughs> These were a style arises out of process, and how the artisan's processes arrive, and I've tried to enter that mentality, and then what comes up does look, it, it relates, because I'm relating to, it, to, to how it happens, not to what's happened. And so um, it's just then we're going to walk around and I'll show you what I've tried to do. And to some extent, I mean, it's, nothing is perfect, but it's, to some extent it does function. So thank you. That is it. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Thank you. Now, uh, I think we should move on to the speakers. And the first speaker is Devendra Narayan Contractor. AIA. He is a licensed architect practicing in New Mexico in the USA. Prior to his career in architecture, Devendra was an adobe and stone mason in the USA and in India. Devendra's firm DNCA has been the recipient of numerous design awards. And uh, I think Devendra should take over from here and talk about uh, DD. Thank you, uh, members of uh, Intac and the larger architectural preservation community that are par participating on this call. Uh, good morning from New Mexico. We have a beautiful hazy morning. We've had haze here from the fires that are raging across the western portion of the U.S. The sky is uh, a gorgeous pink on account of that, but uh, it really highlights some of the environmental issues facing our time, facing uh, this generation of architects and future generations of architects um, who are listening in on this call. I also want to thank you, Katie, for that analysis of vernacular architecture to spot on and also the fabulous memories of that conference that we both attended in Kandbari at Sabhavna. Uh, thank you. Those were quite delightful. Um, usually, I, a small talk like this, I'll just wing it, but it was very difficult for me to think of doing that. Um, and I'm not really going to focus on the academic nature or the polemics of vernacular architecture or the, some of the details of what Ma, my mother, Didi Contractor, uh, did. I'm going to, in a way, this will be a memorial to her from me. And um, I respect your, um, your patience in that. So I'm going to read from some notes I prepared last night. Um, I wanted to start out by saying that the work that INTAC does is, is imp really impressive and very, very essential. Thank you to all of you who participate in that. Remembering a person you love after they pass, this process of grieving is a form of distillation. 
There are so, memories, so many memories to cherish, some to share and some still very private to hold dear and dwell upon. Dee Dee Contractor was my mother and I'll refer to her as Ma. In the interest of being, be, being brief, I will not be anecdotal, but believe me, there are stories out there, fabulous stories uh, that I could, I take delight in remembering and in the future, look forward to meeting with several of you and sharing those stories. Ma loved beauty. Let's dwell on that. She was most herself in the presence of beauty where she lost herself. Anyone who loved Ma knew the importance of a spectacular dawn or sunset. An exquisite flower or a stunning landscape. Beauty perceived through the senses, beauty apprehended through the intellect. Good food, art, culture, conversation, music, poetry, literature, metaphysics, and architecture. For Maya, Rahul, Kiran, and I, it was a childhood at the crossroads where wonder and magic mingled in fantasy. There were periods, definite periods in Ma's life. She was an artist, an intellectual socialite, inter interior designer and decorator for royalty and Bollywood, a spiritual seeker, a renunciate, and lastly, an environmental architect. She was one of the founders of the Bombay International School and is still remembered by my schoolmates with great affection as an inspirational role model. With age and wisdom, Ma became immersed in the fragility of all that she loved. <coughs> the erosion of culture, of tradition, and the global degradation of the environment. In her personal life, through necessity, and then through inner passion, Ma became engrossed in the pressing issues of our time. Ma was an artist and I've always loved her painting and her sculptural work. Others on this call today will speak most likely of the sculptural beauty of her architecture that is so poignantly captured in Joginder Singh's photographs that are part of the book that was published. What was important to me in the context of this presentation and, I wish, and what I wish to touch upon with you briefly is her core environmental values and how they were translated into patterns that permeated every aspect of her life. Convenience was re replaced by what was right. Nowhere was this more present than in her kitchen and in her garden where nothing was wasted and everything was part of a larger pattern, a pattern that reflected conscious decisions of how she lived her life and where she lived. Ma loved to garden and prepare meals from her garden. I loved cooking and gardening with her. I loved to tease her in delight at the rational, evolving complexities she developed around these very simple activities. It all made sense. As her son, I could be rebellious, but I am sure she terrorized many of her interns. Dwelling for Ma was very much part of an ecology of place, which was in turn linked to the preservation of local culture and vernacular tradition. Before you design, before you build, before you preserve, carefully study and understand the significance of where you are physically and temporally. Understand the natural and cultural ecosystems that surround you. In her buildings, the materials of construction were connected to the patterns of local habitation and the use of local resources. In her work, Ma always respected the hand of the artisan and integrated the local crafts into her design. This is true when she was doing 
working as an interior designer, interior decorator um, in the first uh, version of the Lake Palace Hotel to the home that we grew up in. I'm always to the very end, someone who brought people together and brought people and ideas together. She was a teacher and inspired so many aspiring architects. If there's a lasting legacy, I hope that it is to inspire not a formal or literal imitation of her work, but to look and understand how her values permeated all aspects of her life, including her architecture. I hope that it is a legacy that will inspire the love of culture, tradition, the arts, poetry, music, history, cooking, and gardening. I hope it is a legacy to be more, to be better and more responsible beings. Her message would be, get your hands dirty, be messy, be creative, and always walk the talk. Truth in materiality, as well as truth in ideas. Ma sets a really high bar for all of us. And I thank you for this opportunity to briefly share some thoughts about her. Thank you very much. Uh, there couldn't be any better uh, initiation or sort of introduction to her self and her work and her ethos. Uh, that's really calls for very deep engagement. And I think it percolates down to even the listeners now. I have one request before moving to the next speaker. All those who have joined through the Google Meet, please put yourself on mute. Surely the audio mute and possibly also the video mute. Thank you. So we need to move to the next speaker. Chitra Vishwanath, trained as an architect, practices with a wonderful team at Bangalore. The firm is called Biome Environmental Solutions. The firm tries to go beyond creating wonderful spaces, exploring the possibility of building, being part of an ecosystem. Chitra is definitely very well appreciated her work in the south of India. We don't get to see much of it in northern part of the country. So very welcome. And you, I think you are a busy person, but you have agreed to, you know, uh, touch chords with Didi's work. And that will be great for us to hear. No, no, I have the whole evening for Didi, not busy. It was, so I'm much honored to be counted among the peers of Didi who knew her closely. Our association wasn't a long one, just about 13 years. Uh, um, we could, like uh, Devin said, lots of anecdotes. She came over, stayed with us twice, and I've been to Kanbari two, three times. And then we have traveled together to Sikkim and Sonipat, I think it was some godforsaken place too, different places. And we had lots of interactions of that kind. But it has been a deep friendship and has left a lot of impressions, not only of her work, but also of life and philosophy of living. Impressions on how one reads into a culture, develops insights of living and work. The need to et be eternally curious and critical of everything around you. Keeping oneself sharp about the latest issues while being immersed in the local. She, for me, was a perfect embodiment of global. From her, I learned that neither age nor gender can stop you from pursuing one's personal and professional interests and responsibility. Lastly, in all the melee of life, insist on that coffee in the morning and old monk in the evening. Very important for her. And we could do that when we were in Bangalore. I had to make coffee. I, I don't drink coffee. I can't even stand the smell of it. I don't drink old monk. Vishnu drinks it, so it was always there. So Vishnath and him had, and her had great friendship too. And I would like to go beyond talking and I'd like to bring in some impressions of architecture, 
of of some impressions some pictures of what i have enjoyed immensely and much of it shows her love of details so i picked up the last sentence in that movie which katie shared oh god let me and which is nothing is perfect but to some extent it functions and i i don't think it was to some extent it should be to great extent it functioned with dv's works so the, this is i forget the lady's name but the house is quite near dv's place and there's this column and that's a fireplace there's the shelving is everything and it's so sculptural simple and everything with those adobes and this can only happen if somebody is totally immersed and like uh, Katie you said there is no stylistic apologist here it's continuing engagement with the uh, clients too but always looking at what can be done more this is the meeting we had where uh, at sambhavna and that's uh, miss she's the one what's her name i forget she's picturing and that's the movie we kati showed and the love of details pattern making but absolutely nothing of style per se what's the material available this grill in that hospital she was she used to love it and the same thing reflected in the door or how to use a sink and create something more out of it for the I loved this detail. The kitchen thing. This is, I think, they were in your father's house. So you had, and you have the platform just sloping down. So nothing stays in the platform. The water, and it's such a small space. Then the eternal beauty of the material, of the colors, of the light. Every time it's been the light there. How she handled the light is. and when even if you go to show your friends the house you're busy thinking about and sketching and this is the house she is standing in front of so she was never dogmatic if it was dogmatic i think the roofs would have been quite boring no she wanted the light through and for that how do you continually keep looking at new ideas i can never think of twisting and turning the roof so much but then what happens inside is this mesmerizing various roofs this is i think maya's house i i am really fond of these roofs these roofs and then when we understood that uh, slate also mining of slate reduces the water coming into the cool because it chokes up the cool we have at biome decided that we will not use slate as flooring material or any material in the place because these are the most beautiful and apt roofing material in the hills and we should not be using it in the plains at all we have many other materials we could use this is a house i love again look at it how it just grows out of the land and then she's she's formed the land too she's not just left it just like that there's no landscape architect here it's all hers it's the way she immersed into the land it's the way she walked the land all the time that looked at it look at this and there is this use of uh, acrylic sheet you would wonder how come you know a dogmatic vernacular tradition if it is then we wouldn't use that but no she was open to new ideas because light was important and used it and i feel that is deeply vernacular vernacular is not frozen in time vernacular always evolved and it then the red of this door i think its colors are beautiful at and now bringing in the light inside this is in sarit and sandhya's house on the left just by turning the roof and then creating this junction and using acrylic sheet is this light and these are the roofs from one 
column they're springing all over. Okay, I'm sorry. And this is where I was involved. She thought I'm the one who will give her all the ideas on how to make a water tank, which would take some, I think, 5,000 liters of water. But look at it. She worked at it. She figured it out that it should not be done with Adobe. And she's used uh, fire bricks. Attached to it is a little pump house, little, the roof, and then it against the mountains. They're all pieces of beautiful, I can't just say architecture. They're just sculptural. And they're always curious. Even though Jogi is taking the photograph, she had to be there. And I end with this picture. I just love the way the light fell on these adobe walls. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chitra. Um, I think you you have uh, you've been really gone into it. And I, I'm telling the, the viewers, at least those who are the young viewers, that maybe you need to have some patience and be more careful in understanding the connection between the maker and the maid. And that process, what Katie was talking about, that is what is to see and try and imagine in the context in which she had been working. And you have seen some visuals. I wish I could repeat the video recording later on, keep seeing. Thank you very much, Chitra. Uh, we move to Mark Moore. Mark, are you there? Yes, very much. Well, he is an eco social entrepreneur, experimental educator, urban builder composer, co-founder of the Dharmalaya Institute of Compression, uh, sorry, Compassionate Living in India. He has been launching and nurturing altruistic and creative projects around the world since 1997. And you're not an architect. That's good news for us. <laughs> for time. Please, on with it. Thank you so much. Um... I'm feeling a lot today, uh, so forgive me if I'm a bit emotional. I know I'm not the only one. Um, it's really heartwarming to see so many good people here uh, together to honor Didi, and I'm just really pleased to be with all of you. Um, I was asked to speak about Didi and her sense of place specifically, and that's a topic very close to my heart. Uh, so I'm extremely uh, inspired and happy to speak about that. And Didi was all about context. So um, to put this conversation in context, I should say just a few words about myself first. Um, I met Didi around 25 years ago uh, and worked with her since 2009 um, and okay. had the privilege of knowing her as a friend for a long time before we ever worked together. I was I had visited her, uh, her at home and um, was, was so inspired by her, her philosophy, her outlook, her work, um, and had dreamed of having the opportunity uh, to, to work with her on, on a project that uh, I had uh, been dreaming of for some time. And when the opportunity finally arose uh, to create the Dormale Institute, uh, when we found the, the ideal site for it, the ideal place, uh, the land, um, uh, near the village of Bir in Himachal. Uh, I ran straight to Didi and said, Didi, we found the place. Uh, it's time. Um, can we work together? And I explained the vision and she already knew me well enough to, to get what we were after. We wanted to create a place that would support people to come together, come inside, connect with our inner nature and the nature all around us, which indeed are one. And um, we wanted the building, the physical space, to support that work, to support that connection, to support that settling in of the nervous system, and to support that connection with nature, in and out. And Didi was, of course, the perfect person to go to for this. So I explained the vision to her. And... Um, she was delighted and kindly volunteered uh, to work with us on the project. And we discovered it was actually perfect timing. 
um, because she'd been building a long time, but wanted to do more teaching. She, she had resisted that so far. She'd resisted writing and teaching other than the training she'd been doing with local artisans. Um, because uh, as Chitra said, time is not static. Vernacular is not static. Tradition is not static. Everything is moving and she herself was not static. She was always learning. And her, her vision and her approach was evolving. Uh, but now she realized uh, she was getting to the point in life, to the age where she wanted to pass on um, what the wisdom that she had been fortunate enough to accumulate. And so she wanted to teach. And we wanted to create a program to train the next generation. Um, and so we wound up working together on that. Um, and we had the 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 blessed opportunity to work together in a physical place that was inspiringly beautiful six acres of forest um outside of beard uh above the monastery of sherbling beautiful place um i decided not to bring photos today but you can see photos of our campus and the building uh the main building that dd designed for us at uh our website in dharmalia.in and so when we came to this place, um, we brought Didi up there. And I'll tell a short, very short story that, that gives you an initial sense of Didi and her relationship to place. We brought her up the hill. Uh, those of you who have been there know it's a bit of a climb. And uh, so we had a chair waiting for her at the top. She sat down in the chair and before she even caught her breath, she pointed at five of us and said, you, 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 go get me a sample of the earth from there, 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 a few different spots, right? So she sends us off uh, to fetch soil for her. And when we bring these little handfuls of soil back to her, she takes them one by one. And with all the love in the world is just being with the soil for a moment in her palm and playing with it and each each soil sample she studied for maybe a minute and at that time i was a bit new to all this i'd had theory but not the practice so i thought what does she see in there and what she sees is an entire world um and that level of intimacy with the soil with the earth in that moment inspired me and the path that I've been on uh, for the last 12 years since then. Um, yeah. So Didi's sense of place is infinite. It's as intimate as a grain of soil, but it's as intimate as space, infinite as space. It's boundless. Um, place has to be understood as a system. It's interdependent. It's interactive. It includes not just the physical space that we see, but all the currents of energy that move through it. The, the, the wind, the rain, the sun, the influence of the moon, all of these things were important to Didi, both the visible and the invisible aspects of space. Place was both within time and beyond it. Because at any particular point in time, place would have particular qualities. But those qualities arrived over a very long time because of causes and conditions in the earth and its atmosphere. And the place continues. So ultimately, the full significance of place is beyond rational comprehension. And it's important to understand that there's much we can't understand about place, which means one of the most important ingredients to bring to place is curiosity. Be curious about place. So this is one of the things that as Didi and I were working together to develop the internship in vernacular eco-architecture at the Malia, one of the things we found we needed to work on first was that curiosity, because the educational system tends to beat that out of us, 
right? It's important to know and memorize and regurgitate facts. Uh, but then where is the life and the joy in discovery? So those of you who know Didi will know that she could spend so much time outside the beautiful home that she built for herself, just looking around the garden in wonder, watching the birds and, 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 and keeping track of the growth of every plant in the garden. Right. So this, this sense of wonder and curiosity is, is such an important place to begin to understand place in, in our inquiry into place. It starts with, with the emptiness of not knowing. Right. So much more important than, um, than being an expert about architecture is being an empty vessel. Right. Ready to, to notice and, and receive. And um, in the best cases, we can feel so much about place, especially as our natural subtle sensitivities are attuned. And this is where yoga and meditation came in. Uh, and this is something that though Dee didn't speak about it much uh, publicly, her yoga was that connection to place and space and light and form and energy and her approach to design very much began in that place of going deeply inward. In fact, the first meeting that I had with her about the design of what would become our main building at the Mali Institute, uh, we went over the brief kind of quickly. And then she sent me home and said, okay, I've got it. Now I need to forget it. And she just dropped everything out of her mind and uh, went to bed. And then about 3.30 or 4 in the morning, she wakes up and she's been dreaming the space, designing it in her dream, watching it come together. So she wakes up around 4 or so and starts madly scribbling, sketching. And uh, she texts me at 5 in the morning and says, I've got it. Come over and see. Right. And this this was her process. It was it was um, involving the deeper levels, layers of awareness in the design process, that place where our sensitivity resides. So it can't be an intellectual exercise. It can't be something built from muscle memory by rote. Right. Or, or according to any formula. Right. It's something that comes from deep within. It's alive. It's alive in that sense that place is alive. Place, not a static thing, but a dynamic living system. A system of systems within systems, fluid and ever changing. And that aliveness, you know, how can one design for that kind of dynamic, living, moving, ever changing thing if one hasn't observed and felt the site over time? Right? And, you know, sometimes in commercial architecture practice, it's, it's common to, um, it's, uh, to, you know, just be given the, the dimensions of a site and design it in the office, you know, without even setting foot there. And uh, that's something that, you know, Didi would find maddening because, uh, how, you know, how can you do that? The tradition is to observe a site in all seasons before we begin designing for it, before we begin, begin building, um, to see it in winter, to see it in monsoon, right? Uh, so you understand how the water moves, how the, how the sun comes, will come through the windows at different times of year, right? To understand these aspects of place. So place is also the earth, its elements, water, wind, light, and so on. Place is also the Earth's resources, and that includes their preciousness, right? One of the things that I had such a delight in learning as I first began working with Didi is how precious every single um, aspect of the Earth is, you know, because we have, you, you look at the soil and, and the uninitiated eye would just see dirt, right? We've got dirt, we've got rocks. But every different size of particle is useful for something, right? 
every particle is precious. And for each of them, we have, you know, just enough, none to waste. And so that preciousness of, of um, all of the Earth's resources is another critical part of place. And that's the reason, not because of any sort of dogmatic philosophy, as Chitra was saying, but that's the main reason for Didi's approach of using as much as possible materials sourced from the site itself, partly to, yes, uh, reduce the, the, the carbon cost of, of uh, bringing in market materials, uh, but mostly to maintain that intimacy um, with the place where, where we're creating. Um, and also, of course, to be sensitive to the impacts on the earth at each stage of the life cycle of a building from the groundbreaking where we begin to disturb the earth all the way up to the eventual inevitable decomposition of the building. The building, when its life is finished, should go back to the earth, should become compost for the soil, right? Because the building is, comes from the place, will return to the place. Right. The place also includes its plants and animals. Um, sensitivity to the the paths that the local animals take, the birds, the the ground squirrels, um, every creature that moves through the space. The, your neighbors, the the local villagers. What are the paths that that they, they take through the place? Um, sensitivity to these things. And of course, another aspect that's often ignored, uh, and Didi, um, for Didi, this was very, very important. The place where we build also includes its people and their wisdom and their traditions, their skills. Um, and as Chitra said, these, you know, these traditions are not static. They're ever changing, ever evolving. It's a living vernacular, but another aspect of the place and its people is the way those people are treated. And one of the things that, um, that Didi felt so passionately about was respect for artisans. As much as possible, we want to use the gifts and talents of the artisans who are native to a place where we're building. And we want to give them proper food we want to give them, you know, not just not just a, you know, a, a decent uh, paycheck, but it's such a simple thing, but it's often overlooked. And Didi would get so upset about this that that people would want to build a beautiful earthen home for themselves, but then they would want to hire uh, local laborers, pay them as little as possible, and give them laborer food, right? Give them a simpler version. So eventually, Didi would put it in her contract with new clients that, um, uh, yes, you know, I'm happy to work with you on your project, but one of my stipulations is you'll hire local artisans, you'll pay them a proper wage to, 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 to respect the immense craft that they, that they have and the importance of that craft, and you'll give them the same food you would give guests in your own home, your own precious guests, guests you know. Um, and we give this kind of respect to the to the people of the place. So all of these points converge on one thing, which is the importance of sensitivity. Sensitivity to place, to the nuance of place, but not just to the more obvious things like light and and shape and form and texture, but the living nature, the fact that we're working in a place where beings who are alive and feeling are and will continue to be, perhaps even after we're gone. So to approach the whole design process with the respect for the living organism of the earth and all the beings who inhabit it, and especially those who are most local to the place and to approach all of that with sensitivity and love. And I really feel that that's the essence that, that lies beneath uh, Didi's entire approach. And the thing 
uh, that she and I have in common and have been trying to instill uh, in our students uh, since we began working together to teach and, and pass on this wisdom. So I'll, I'll leave it with that point. Um, all of this comes down to sensitivity and love. Thank you all. Thank you, Mark. Uh, we may have more time to discuss later, but I must make it a point here, uh, one point among all that you said. One thing struck that all the meditation places halls and chambers, they are really made in pure form. There's a tendency like that. And uh, it seems to be that's the kind of a thought people have. And you mentioned that the idea of meditation, which she was, uh, you know, in. At the same time, she was nowhere near making a huge big sphere or a lotus for meditation. Anyway, we'll come back to that later. Perhaps thank you so much. Uh, Narishji is the next speaker. I need to tell people something about you. Naresh Kumar Sharma is an eco-builder in Rakka, Himachal Pradesh. His journey with Didi began in the year 1994 as an apprentice to a traditional carpenter who built Didi's own home. Ever since, he has worked very closely with Didi on all of her building projects and mastered the craft of masonry, carpentry, amongst many others. Over the course of many years, he has trained many local artisans at various building sites and has also taught at the natural building workshops organized by Dharmalaya Institute of Compassion at Living. He is currently working on a few independent building projects while training young novice and architects who are keenly interested to learn about natural building. Naresh Namaskar Naresh Namaskar. मैं 11 अप्रैल 1994 को दीदी से मिला जब वो अपना घर बना रहे थे और दीदी से मेरा मिलना या दीदी का मेरी जिंदगी में आना वो मेरे लिए बहुत सौभाग्य की बात थी मैंने उनसे क्या सीखा बिल्डिंग के बारे में बिल्डिंग की तकनीक प्लांटिंग और गार्डनिंग तो जब वो अपना घर बना रहे थे तब मैं 19 साल का था तो उनके पास काम करने आया मेरी ड्यूटी थी मैं सबसे छोटा था टीम में तो मेरी ड्यूटी थी कि वर्कर को चाय बनाना तो दीदी ने अपने घर के पास एक सोलर कुकर बनाया था तो सुबह आके 9 बजे मैं उसमें एक पॉट में पानी चीनी चाय और एक में दूध डाल देता था फिर 10:30 पे सबको चाय प्रोवाइड करना फिर उसके बाद फिर उसमें चाय चीनी और दूध सोलर कुकर में डाल के 3:30 पे फिर सब लोगों को चाय देना और उसके बाद जो मेरे पास टाइम था उसमें दीदी ने मुझे कहा कि आप कारपेंटर के हेल्पर बन जाओ क्योंकि मैं सबसे यंग था तो उस वक्त कोई इलेक्ट्रॉनिक प्लेनर या कोई भी टूल नहीं था ना ड्रिल मशीन ना कुछ सारा काम जो मैनुअल हाथ से करते थे तो मैं फिर वो कारपेंटर के साथ हेल्पर कारपेंटर उस वक्त जो थे राजमल वो अराउंड 50 ईयर ओल्ड थे और मैं 19 का था तो जब भी हम दीदी का घर बना रहे थे तो मैंने मशीनरी तो उस वक्त करी नहीं पर कारपेंटर की हेल्पर के के रूप में काम किया तो जब हम वो दीदी कुछ कागज पे एक स्केच देते थे कि अच्छा ऐसे करना है ऐसे करना है तो मुझे वो कुछ समझ नहीं आता था तो मैं सोचता था कि अच्छा ये ये क्या ऐसे कागज पे लाइन लगाई है मुझे कुछ मैं कारपेंटर के पास चला जाता था फिर वो जब वो घर बना और फिर उसका छत बना तो फिर एक साल के बाद मुझे कुछ समझ आने लगा कि नहीं ये कुछ चीज अलग है फिर मैं वो धीरे-धीरे धीरे समझने लगा और जब दीदी के घर की रूप हमने कंप्लीट करी तो जितना भी वो लेफ्ट ओवर बैंबू पीसेस और स्लेट पीस था तो मुझे दीदी ने एक दिन कहा कि ये सारे इकट्ठे कर लो और इनको एक बोरी में डाल के रखो तो मैं ये इसको हम कहीं यूज करेंगे तो मैंने सोचा हम तो लोकल घरों में ये चीज जलाने के काम करते हैं इसका क्या बनेगा तो पर फिर मैंने उनको इकट्ठा करके रख दिया और जब छत करने के बाद जब दीदी आते थे 11 बजे और हम बैठे उन्होंने कहा कि वो पीस कहां है वो बोरी लाओ तो मैं वो लेके गया तो उन्होंने कहा कि इसको हम स्प्लिट करके फाड़ के 
इसकी हम सेल्फ बनाएंगे तो मैंने सोचा ये क्या बना रहे हैं सेल्फ कैसे बनेगी क्या बनेगी तो फिर उन्होंने उस अलग अलग जो पीस थे उनका जो जैसे कि अच्छा अब बुक सेल्फ है क्लॉथ सेल्फ है डिस वॉश एरिया में किचन में सेल्फ है तो वो सारे पीसेस के हिसाब से वो सारी सेल्फ बनाई तो वो मुझे एक चीज समझ में आई कि ये हम क्या क्या कर सकते हैं तो वो पीस और जो बहुत ही छोटे पीस थे चार इंच तीन इंच मैंने सोचा इसका तो कुछ नहीं बनेगा तो दीदी ने कहा कि इनकी हम टैग बनाएंगे नेल्स बनाएंगे जो हम दीवार पे लगा के जिसमें हम अपना अमरेला कोट रेन कोट ये सब हैंग कर सकते हैं तो मैंने वो फिर और जो स्लेट के पीस थे उनका हमने बाथरूम में टाइल के रूप में यूज किया तो मुझे वो लगा कि ये तो सब चीजें यूज हो सकती हैं तो मैंने एक चीज उनसे ये सीखी उनके काम में कि जीरो वेस्ट कि जो छत में वेस्टिंग था वो सब हमने यूज किया नेल तक थ्री इंच का बैम्बू वो सब नेल के ये सीखा उसके बाद धीरे 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 मैं थोड़ा सीखा फिर हमने दीदी की फ्रेंड केशवर सिराली का घर बनाया तो दीदी ने एक रफ स्केच बनाया कागज पे उस प्लान का उस प्लान में लिखा था डीप सेलो नैरो वाइड तो मुझे वो कागज दिया और कहा कि पढ़ो तो मैंने वो कागज तो पढ़ लिया कि डीप सेलो नैरो और वाइड पर मुझे वो कुछ समझ नहीं था कि इसका मतलब क्या है तो उन्होंने मुझे कहा कि पढ़ लिया मैंने कहा हाँ तो क्या मतलब है मैंने कहा मुझे नहीं पता तो उन्होंने कहा कि डीप मतलब बिल्डिंग में जिसको सबसे गहरा खोदना है और वाइड खोदना है फिर जो सेलो और नैरो है उनको कम चौड़ा और कम गहरा खोदना है तो मैंने कहा ऐसा क्यों तो उन्होंने कहा जहां पे हमारा डोर आ रहा है जहां पे हमारी पार्टीशन वॉल आ रही है वो हम नैरो और सेलो करेंगे और जो हमारा हाइस्ट पॉइंट है जो हमारा लोड वेयरिंग पॉइंट है उसको हम वाइड और डीप करेंगे तो उससे मेरी ट्रेनिंग जो थी वो शुरू हो गई कि बिल्डिंग स्ट्रक्चर का वो ग्राउंड से कि पहले जो एक्सकवेशन है उसको कैसे करना है तो वो मैंने पढ़ा और फिर वो वैसे किया उसके बाद जब हम फिलिंग करने लगे जो टेक्निक्स मैं बता रहा हूँ जो मैंने उनसे सीखा तो टेक्निक्स में उन्होंने कहा कि अब इसमें जो हमने पत्थर भरने तो जो सबसे खराब पत्थर उसको वो बोलते थे कि पहले ही छांट के रख लो अलग से उठा के क्योंकि जब हम बाद में काम करते हैं तो सब कुछ ना कुछ सब डाल देते हैं इसलिए पहले जो खराब पत्थर है जिसमें सारा वो हॉर्न्स हैं उनको नीचे डालो वो जमीन में बहुत अच्छी तरह से ग्राउट हो जाएंगे तो फिर उनको डाला फिर पत्थर डाला फिर उन्होंने कहा कि इसमें अब मिट्टी भरो फिर मिट्टी भरी और उन्होंने पूछा कि क्यों भर रहे हो मिट्टी तो मैंने कहा पता नहीं क्यों भर रहे हैं तो उन्होंने कहा कि अगर हम पत्थर लगाते हैं और उनके बीच में कैविटीज रहती हैं खोखलापन तो उसमें क्या होगा कि एयर गैप होगा और एयर गैप होने से बिल्डिंग बाद में क्रैक करेगी तो इसलिए इसको हमेशा याद रखो कि प्लिंथ जब करते हैं तो उस मिट्टी को डालने के बाद उसके ऊपर पानी फेंको ताकि वो एक एक जगह पे जाके वो पूरा स्टोन वर्क जो वो कंपैक्ट हो जाए तो ऐसे ये तकनीक सीख के वो पत्थर का और मिट्टी का कॉम्पैक्ट करके वो हमारा हो गया फाउंडेशन वर्क वो तकनीक और उसके बाद जब दीवार मट मट की दीवार शुरू करी स्टोन वर्क के बाद तो दीदी कहते थे कि पहले जब भी हम कोई काम करते हैं तो जो वर्कर्स हैं उनको पहले एक्सप्लेन करो कि हम क्या कर रहे हैं और क्यों कर रहे हैं इसका क्या एडवांटेज और डिसएडवांटेज है तो वो तो हम जब दीदी के इधर करते थे काम तो सब शाम सब सुनते ही थे और सबको बताते ही थे तो जब मट ब्रिक शुरू करी मट ब्रिक का तो हमारा जो दीदी के बिल्डिंग्स में एक सैम्फर्ड कॉर्नर है जहाँ पे हमने एक सैम्फर्ड ब्रिक लगाई तो वो मुझे मैंने कहा कि ये क्यों किया तो उन्होंने ना उन्होंने मुझे कहा कि ये क्यों किया तो मैंने ऐसे कह दिया कि शोभा के लिए उन्होंने कहा नहीं शोभा के लिए नहीं इसका लॉजिक है तो उन्होंने कहा लॉजिक ये है कि शोभा एक बात है और जो हमने कॉर्नर सैम्फर्ड किया इससे हमें मोर लाइट अंदर आएगी और जो एक साथ एज है वो कभी नहीं टूटेगा तो फिर वैसे वैसे वो मुझे सिखाते गए और मैं थोड़ा थोड़ा सीखता गया धीरे धीरे तो वो बोलते थे कि हर चीज शोभा के लिए नहीं है पर उसका एक लॉजिक भी है एस्थेटिक्स भी है उसमें हम मिट्टी भी सेव कर रहे हैं कॉर्नर भी सेम्फर्ड है और लाइट भी ज्यादा आएगा तो ये वॉल का बात फिर हम रूफ रूफ जो ग्राउंड फ्लोर करते हैं 
उसमें हम वुडन बीम करते हैं तो दीदी वो कहते थे कि ये पिल्लर हम क्यों बना रहे हैं जो हम फाउंडेशन से डीप करते हैं क्योंकि ये जो पिल्लर है इनके ऊपर हमारा वुडन स्लीप पर बैठ रहे हैं जिसके ऊपर ग्राउंड फ्लोर का वेट आ रहा है तो वो उन्हों, वो उन्होंने सिखाया ऐसे कि ये है फिर छत का फिर छत में पहुंचे तो छत में वो बताते थे कि अब छत का जो डिजाइन है वो हम ऐसे करते हैं कि हमें क्या क्या चाहिए व्यू लाइट और पानी को कैसे डाइवर्ट करना है और कैसे उस पानी को वाटर हार्वेस्टिंग सिस्टम से हम नीचे ला सकते हैं तो छत का वो कि अच्छा कहाँ गेबल बनाना है गेबल कैसे होना चाहिए उसमें उस गेबल से सन एंगल क्या है और स्काईलाइट कहाँ रखनी है जिससे कम से कम लीकेज हो ये सब छत के बारे में उनसे मैंने सीखा फिर डिज़ाइन के बारे में तो डिज़ाइन तो दीदी ऐसे करते थे दीदी बोलते थे कि आप घर पे बैठ के डिज़ाइन कभी नहीं कर सकते आप डिज़ाइन साइट पे कर सकते हो तो आप साइट पे जाओ हर एक दिन साइट आपको बताएगी कि क्या इम्प्रूवमेंट होनी है तो वो सब डिज़ाइन जो है वो साइट पे जाके होता है फिर उसके बाद आ, 1994 से आ, 2008 एट और 9 तक मैंने और दीदी ने ही साथ में काम किया है तब कोई इंटर्न्स और आर्किटेक्ट नहीं था आर्किटेक्ट आए जब धर्मालय का काम हमने शुरू किया 2012 में तो जब हमने वो जब हम दोनों काम करते थे तो जो दीदी के सराउंड ये बिल्डिंग्स बनी है इसमें कहीं भी किसी घर का कोई पूरा प्लान नहीं जिसमें सेक्शन और रूफ और पूरा प्लान हो तो दीदी सिर्फ प्लान बनाते थे और प्लान के बाद वो मेरे लिए एक रोज एक स्केच करके कि आज ये काम करना है फिर उतना करके नेक्स्ट डे फिर मैं आता था आज आज ये काम तो वो उतना वो सुबह सोच सोच के इम्प्रूवमेंट करके वो सारा जब तक घर बन जाता था पूरा डिजाइन बन जाता था और आ, उनसे मैंने वो प्लांटिंग के बारे में सीखा कि कौन सा कौन सा पौधा कहाँ लगाना चाहिए कौन वाटर को ऑब्जर्व करता है वो है प्लांटिंग का कटिंग का ये ये थोड़ा थोड़ा ये भी सीखा है तो मुझे लगता है कि बिल्डिंग का तो मैंने लगभग उनसे जो अभी तक हम करते हैं जिसमें बैम्बू है स्टोन है मट है गुड है ये चार जो हमारे मेजर मटेरियल है वो यूज करते हैं और जहाँ जहाँ हम अभी जैसे धर्मालय है या उत्तराखंड में भी मैंने एक मेडिटेशन हॉल बनाया है किन्नौर में भी तो हम मैं वहाँ जाके वहाँ के लोकल जो आर्टिस्ट हैं उनको भी ट्रेन करता हूँ कि बाद में आपको ही यहाँ काम करना है ताकि वो सीख जाए तो ये जैसे मुझे दीदी ने सिखाया वैसे मैं भी उनको कि अच्छा आप तो आगे ये काम करना हम ऐसे कर रहे हैं कुछ आगे मेंटेनेंस करनी है या किसी को बनाना है तो वो सब आप आगे कर सकते हो तो मुझे लगता है कि ये सब चीज़ें थी बाकी दीदी ने जो मुझे सिखाया है मार्ट इन्वायरमेंट के बारे में इको बिल्डिंग के बारे में जो मैं अभी कर रहा हूँ और जो हम करते आए हैं मुझे लगता है दीदी के चिन्हों पे जो उन्होंने बताया उन उस उन चीजों को आगे बढ़ाना कैरी ऑन रखना मेरे लिए उनके लिए एक सच्ची श्रद्धांजलि होगी धन्यवाद बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद नरेश जी लक्ष्मी आई थिंक यू आर सपोज टू ट्रांसलेट सम ऑफ थिंग्स ही सेड दे यू नो ओवरलैप विद योर ओन स्पीच वुड यू लाइक टू डू फर्स्ट एंड देन गो ऑन योर ओन Sure, sure, sure. I can do that. So, uh, my Hindi is not excellent, <laughs> but still, I will try my best. Uh, so, he was telling about how um, you know he came to DD in the year of 1994, and the first work that he was put to was to make chai for all the workers and make chai in the solar cooker that DD had designed yeah. and built. Uh, I think in the around 1993, four, 1994 only. and then slowly so during the rest of the time when he was not doing labor work he was made to assist a carpenter uh didi i still remember didi narrating the story naresh had come to me you know he was this very thin lean guy and i wanted him to have like strong muscles so i have put him to work with a carpenter so he could plane and increase his muscles <laughs> so that was the first thing that naresh bhai had did and uh, he also said um, about um, you know how he 
he was not able to understand Didi's drawings. It was just a series, a set of lines on a paper. Um, and uh, but after this house, you know, Didi's own home was built. Then uh, you know, also having assisted this other carpenter who could read the drawing, he was able to read drawing and understand what Didi, uh, you know, meant to say and could actually see the translated version of the drawing, you know, as a built form. Then slowly he worked, uh, the, uh, the next project he worked with Didi on, he worked directly under her, uh, where Didi used to give him drawings, uh, you know, hand, hand, over drawings, hand over drawings to him directly. Um, and the first drawing, there was this drawing of a foundation which said like narrow, wide, uh, you know, mm -hmm. deep and shallow. So he didn't understand what it was. And when he asked Didi, Didi said, there are only the main, you know, parent wall, the load, the main load bearing walls of the building actually need like deep uh, and wide foundations. Uh, mm -hmm. The other parts where we have, um, uh, you know, doors or like big uh, French windows or like partition walls, they don't need so much foundation. So why do we waste material and why do we have to waste uh, time and labor also so that and slowly from there you know so every step that dd would uh, make till the year 2008 it was only dd and him who interacted between each other uh, so dd would design and he would build at site um, and through the entire process he was able to learn not only the how to do a building uh, in a certain way but the why to uh, do something in a certain way uh, and uh, that that is one of the most uh, crucial teachings in uh, you know Didi's. Uh, that is one of the crucial things that Didi has taught is like never just look for a how to manual, but you know ask questions, learn why to do a certain thing in a certain way. So he was able to understand Didi's sense of aesthetics and also um, you know build his own um, um, intellect uh, by working with Didi constantly. <laughs> And uh, he has also now um, worked with, uh, uh, you know, Dharmalaya, where he has trained a lot of people. And he feels very confident to uh, work in a different place, like, say, Uttarakhand, um, where he has built um, uh, a meditation hall. So he was able to train people and uh, take a drawing and explain to them why a certain thing is done in a certain way. because. One of the things Didi strongly believed in is that when us when we understand why we do something, then we do it right. When we don't know why we do it, then there are a, a lot of possibilities for mistakes. So that has been his main journey, and um, he also explained about a lot of uh, you know at improvisations Didi made in her buildings, uh, which I will show you in the visual uh, visual, so there would be better understanding. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, Lakshmi Swaminathan, who was speaking, graduated as an architect in 2013 from MEASI, that's Academy of Architecture, Chennai. Later, she worked in a conventional architectural office, taught in design schools, and also pursued her passion in Khadi textile through weaving and block printing. Lakshmi's interest in vernacular architecture and responsible building brought her to Didi Contractor in 2017. Ever since she lived with Didi, assisted her in writing the book, An Adobe Revival, Didi Contractor's Architecture, uh, by Joginder Singh, an appreciate apprentice in Didi's building projects. In the last two years, Lakshmi has independently designed and built a few homes in Kangra Valley under Didi's mentorship. Uh, Lakshmi, I think you can take on and you have a presentation? Yeah. So you go the way you want uh, to start with the presentation, maybe? Thanks to Intac and thanks to um, Katie Ravindran also for, uh, you know, organizing this and pr bringing people from uh, different, I mean, two different continents to do this for Didi. Thank you so much. Um, and. Uh, Many all, all of you have already spoken earlier, um, have spoken almost everything about DD. So mine will. So when we talk about DD contractor and Kangra Valley, so to give you the basic, um, you know, contextual, uh, to give you the location. So this is how one of the part of Kangra Valley looks like. 
and uh, these were the buildings you know that existed in the past uh, these days the valley has very less and less number of buildings like this and most of these buildings were all uh, made with adobe um, you know local uh, sun dried mud bricks and with bamboo and wood and slates um, and also like mud plastered so yeah so this um, yeah so basically the kangra valley uh, the vernacular of this region was uh, you know mostly made with local slate stones called chakka and uh, uh, earth and uh, bamboo and uh, you know uh, wood so didi came to the valley in the year 19 around 1975 76 she moved here for various reasons um, and she settled in uh, a village called andreta where she act, uh, where she actually um, you know wanted to live a solitude life uh, continuing her own spiritual journey uh, reading a lot and you know uh, practicing uh, her spiritual journey uh, so during that time she had this opportunity to design uh, and build a solar cooker and uh, that was uh, i think in the year 1970 um, 1985 or 1985 she had a project by the indo german um, you know uh, organization to design and build a solar cooker in a place where the accessible accessibility to gas cylinder was very very minimal so over her years and years of observation and over her years and years of interaction and respect to local tradition and culture she was able to design an instrument made of stones mud uh you know used uh, oil tin sheets um rice husk then waste aluminum foil and the only market material that she had to bring in that she brought, bought new was the glass and there she was you know she designed and built a solar cooker that was completely functional after uh, and she she also during this process she worked a lot with local um you know craftsmen local people who knew how to build in mud then and uh, she was as a part of this project she was made to go to a uh, different uh, you know villages and promote solar cooker so while she went to different villages she was able to uh, you know observe and notice a lot of architectural details and she made drawings so i would say her period of living in andrita was was basically the initiation for her to build you know build with adobe in kangra valley and uh, on the right side that a picture that you see is uh, delicious plum jams that we made last year in the solar and uh, as naresh bhaiya and many people also told you know she would never ever waste any single thing that comes her way it would always be recycled so she would make uh, she would be able to uh, heat up the plum uh, skin that had a little bit of the plum uh, fruit in it and you know make syrups then she would make jams and she would make pickle and she would make sh sh sharbat and jelly and what not you know and it, it is just endless um this the next slide that you see here is the first house that she designed and built uh you know or mainly designed this is the house that she uh, designed for herself and her family in juhu and this is where all all of all her children grew up um and this was mostly made with uh, red bricks and lime mortar with uh, you know thatch uh, or somewhere asbestos roof also this was located on the at the shore of juhu and she has she said she had to make a temporary um, you know more more like a temporary structure because you know the land was on lease so this was a first um building i would say that she designed and next um i'm going to so show you a series of photographs now i'm sure everyone who has met didi and who has not met didi would be so thrilled to see so this is a sketch that she made before she built her house um this was made april 25th i think in 1994 thanks to kiran narayan who was very kind enough to scan these photographs and send them to me so if you see all her drawings they're all you know they're all very simple pencil drawings but with clear indications and clear instructions what comes where and that i think was very very specific to didi that even the simplest of her drawings had all the details that we needed for a particular day of work at site 
And uh, so here's Didi from 1994. So this is the puja for her house. Um, so when we talk about vernacular, it's and DD, vernacular architecture and DD or DD in vernacular architecture, it's not only, um, you know, her relationship with materials and techniques, but it's her relationship with the ecology of the place. It's her relationship with the culture, with the tradition. So she would, she though she was an outsider, she would always, you know, take part and participate in any of the villages, uh, functions, festivals. She was constantly a part of, you know, if there was a different puja for the house, she was, she respected, she respected, she learned and she took part in the process. And that is something that I find very, um, you know, uh, special about Didi because it's not only in terms of architecture, but it's her way of life that was very, very vernacular. And um, this is, uh, these are the pictures of, um, these are the photographs that Didi had taken um of all the slates and the adobe big bricks that you know where they were stacking and the bamboos freshly cut so with regard to the building materials uh, you know the local people they know how to make adobe bricks so uh, you know she followed that during the initial building process um then with regarding to bamboo the they were always cut during a particular time during winter um new moon ke baad na after new moon, there is this ashtami to another ashtami. That is the only particular time that they cut because that time the starch content in the bamboo would be very less. Uh, so she would follow those, those traditions. And after they were cut, they would be put in the local kul. I'm, I mean, a cut, cut is a part of the river stream where you can actually, you know, uh, probably uh, take a bath or like, you know, store things like bamboos for curing. And once it was cured in the river, then it would be smoked. So these are the process with bamboo. Slates, we have slates, uh, you know, just about like three, four kilometers from where we live. And uh, they would come from there, you know, in donkeys and <laughs> mules. Mm -hmm. And uh, they would be carrying the slates and mud bricks. Um, so whenever Didi designed any play, any building, uh, it was not only the building that she designed. It's a holistic approach. She would approach the site first. She would think, okay, so yeah, so yeah, so I showed you some pictures of uh, you know uh, the usage of materials, but here is a picture of Didi um, working with the people at site. So one of the things that Didi, um, you know, I wouldn't say it's an inspiration from vernacular, but one of the things that Didi did was uh, if you look at all the traditional architecture, people. The, the inhabitants, you know, or the people who are going to live in the house, uh, the local villagers, they would all come together to build. Uh, everyone knew how to build, actually. You know, it was a basic uh, human skill, not like not the traditional um, uh, 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 like craftsmanship, like carpentry or like, you know, extremely intricate masonry. But basically putting a wall together, people were able to do it. They would, you know, form teams. So in a way, Didi was the person who actually taught me that, you know, in, if I have to be an architect, that I need to learn how to build. I need to be at the site and I need to know, I need to work with the with the workers and only then I'll be able to build. Once she actually told me, you know, it's, it's so strange to ask architects to design. Um, it's like, it's, it's very strange to ask, ask architects who don't know how to build to design because it's like asking somebody who has never cooked to write a cooking manual, you know? So DD was constantly showing that, you know, there has to be a constant interaction. And this, this interaction actually helped her evolve, give new ways to vernacular, actually. It helped her evolve, uh, you know, um, improvise on the materials. It helped her improvise on the technique. It helped her teach, the craftsmen also. Also, I'm sorry, I shouldn't be saying teach craftsmen. Um, I think all of the local people, they already had this innate knowledge uh, They because they've been seeing and they've been taking part in these processes since they were young. But Didi was the one who actually reaffirmed, you know, revalued and gave them the value that, you know, whatever they know, whatever 
they uh, they have been doing as tradition and culture is worth it and you know she she was the one she she would she would encourage people to actually work in this direction you know and that way people were very motivated to do something like this next slide yeah so look at this picture so here didi i think uh, that's the first time uh, um, i'm she is making a fireplace and uh, if you actually ever read didi's uh, you know mm, mm, any uh, lecture, if you have any if you've read any interview about how she fell in love with adobe she would always always start with adobe fireplaces that she made as a teenager when she helped her parents uh, move uh when she helped her parents renovate uh, you know their a 200 year old adobe home in taos and that's where she actually fell in love with adobe buildings and uh, this is a clear picture you know her hand she is working with the people she is making a fireplace by herself and she is 65 years old can anyone actually believe this and this is a, probably the first time she has started building on her own here um uh, next slide yeah so this is uh, one of the pictures of the first floor of didi's house uh, where uh, you know people are building uh, there is, this is a southern room with a series of windows so at that time you know this window actually over overlooked a beautiful valley i have some photographs where you know there are pictures overlooking the valley but uh, right now it's um, uh but right now it's uh, there are buildings but still didi made a beautiful garden so this is basically overlooking that and she made this southern room so that with a lot of windows so that it would warm the room during uh, winter and it would be a more comfortable room to stay in um so here are like two i think this is one of the oldest masons who would work with didi i think he is no more next slide next slide please yeah so this is another picture when uh, as dd got old and because of many age related ailments so she would she would go to the site she would work with the people she would make at least like at least till she was about 84 80 83 84 she would visit the site at least like once in 3 days right once in Three three days, and she was constantly like think about the site. She would always tell me like you know every time um, uh, every every time you're actually designing, it's best to get up in the morning first thing, have a cup of coffee, and then think what people are going to do at the site, and then plan the work at site, and then you know work with people accordingly. And uh, this is a picture where she is working with uh, Kaka Ji, who is also a local mason who worked with her. who worked with her until you know the last project that she designed and built next slide please yeah so this is another picture of her own home uh, people who have visited didi's place i think i'm sure you guys are all very thrilled to see these pictures mm -hmm. as i was very thrilled um this is a view from um the ha oh. huh, the east uh, western northwestern side looking at the staircase and uh, you know the northern windows of the house and this sh clearly shows you know the roof structure and uh, you know the bamboos so you see some of the bamboos are like very long right so like naresh bhaiya said didi would like whatever pieces were cut she would carefully sit and then think okay what do i do with this and then she would make like pegs for in on which things would hang and then she would make uh, you know um, like uh, stands and shelves you know all these things so basically in didi's building there was nothing that was in excess and there was hardly anything that was wasteful you know so i would say the building was just there and, i mean present you know just just being present next slide please yeah so this is one of the window i i wanted to put this picture because naresh bhaiya was explaining um, you know about the chamfered wall can you show the next slide then i will come back to this one yeah if you look at these bricks then you see some of the bricks you know they have their edge uh, uh, corners chamfered so if you go back to the previous one previous slide so she would place those bricks you know at uh, the corner between the window you know and the wall so that that would a it would um, you know not give like a uh, uh it would not 
there would be a good light that would come. She would always say that, you know, there are a lot of things that are incremental. Every increment in luminosity will add up to light in the space, you know. So this was one of the details. So DD, because she was constantly engaging with the materials, because she was constantly immersed in the process of building, she was able to come up with, uh, uh, you know, her, she was able to come up with um, improvisations that would uh, make the space a bit better. And she was constantly thinking of how she could do it better, how she could do it better. And that was also guiding her process of uh, building. And also because these chamfered walls are there, even when you move furniture, when you take some things out, the corner generally will chip off, you know, because it's mud, slightly it will chip off. Because there's a co chamfered corner, it will not chip off. Next. Next. Yeah. And uh, coming to the improvisation she made in uh, the materials, one of the things she added was, you know, the the uh, the rice husk, the rice shellar husk. So after the paddy, I mean, after the rice is thrashed and you know stuff, the shilka, shilka is the skin of the rice. Uh, it would, it's a byproduct that would be you know thrown off. So DD uh, generally she would spread that uh, where you know where we make bricks. Uh, she would spread that on the ground and then make the bricks on top of them because A, it would give a good friction between the brick and the mortar. B, it uh, helps lighten the brick. C, it also adds to the insulation. It, it adds up it, it, another one increment, you know, incremental insulation. It is also added to, um, you know, the, the building. Next slide. Ah, so this is the latest, I would say, that Didi kind of, uh, you know, added in her uh, vocabulary of design. Uh, so she made a partition wall with a um, partition wall uh, that was to insulate. Um, and this partition wall was made with uh, wooden planks on one side and uh, split bamboo on the other side. And in between these two, aluminum foil was stuck. And between them, there was like a lot of silver paper and thermocol, high density thermocol that was uh, put inside. Because uh, high density thermocol is a good insulating material, silver foil, when it gets a lot of heat, uh, you know, because silver is a shiny material and aluminum foil is also a shiny material, they'll constantly reflect the light and reflect the heat also. So this is one of the things that, uh, you know, she added because this was uh, in a room which was actually open uh, to the outside. So she experimented this in her own house. She would always say, like, if you ever want to experiment, experiment it first in your own house before you actually go ahead and experiment it somewhere else. Next, please. Yeah, these are small, small pebbles that we get in the riverside. Next slide. And this is the picture that you see on the left is one of the ways that Didi would use. So it's a very beautiful space. Uh, you know, I really like this part. This is right outside uh, Didi's home where, uh, you know, it's it's a mix of the big river stones and then the small pebbles kept upright and then the chakkas, the slates. And uh, these small pebbles, you know, they actually almost form like a carpet. So even if you're walking barefoot, you can just wipe off your feet and then come inside. So these are the small, small details. You know, these are, um, what do you say? These are very practical and also aesthetically pleasing. And Didi was somebody who was so ingenious mm -hmm. in inventing new details that would be both practical and aesthetically possible. And there was always something that she would say, she would say, you know, every problem is a design opportunity. So anything that we actually see as a problem, it's an opportunity for us to come up with a practical solution, but also be able to come up with something that would be visually pleasing. And on the right side is, uh, you know, her new room that she built. And below you see is a small berm, which is actually filled with plastic waste because she says that she doesn't know what to do, but some, someday when somebody finds a way to get rid of this plastic she would be able to get rid of but it's also filled with earth and spider grass and ivy plant you know which are all like good uh, water um, containing plants so she has also put this and this is on the northern side so her main idea was to, uh, to do this was to protect you know her room or give it more insulation because during summer a berm would like you know give up a lot more heat and during i mean uh, chillness and during winter it would actually uh give more heat next slide please uh -huh. just a minute and um uh, 
yeah so these this is a very simple earth path technique which i think a lot of people know so she would use this to berm the uh, hillside uh, because in many sites uh, particularly like some some place like dharmalaya where uh, you know there's a lot of rocky the earth is not very clay but there's more rocks and aggregate uh, content in it so she would fill this and then this would form a retaining wall on the hillside later they would like you know grass would automatically grow so it will also become a part of the landscape next slide please yeah so this is one of the kitchen you know that's a uh, local uh, i mean it's a local person's kitchen and just just see the quality of the light the way things are kept here now the next slide and look at this it's uh, i mean i just i don't know sometimes i just feel lost for words to describe her kitchen but you know so many different objects so many different vessels so many different things and everything kept in a certain order you know it's like even chaos has a certain order and uh, also like all her uh, and none of these things are never unused that's the best part in her kitchen and most of the things you know and everything is within a certain reach so one of the things that you know she like the vernacular houses um you know mostly about the vernacular houses serve a function of uh, you know sheltering people and uh, serve a certain function of accessibility and you know all of that and also being uh, the vernacular houses they are built you know at a particular moment at a particular place so they relate to the seasons they relate to uh, the functionality of the place and so many other things and this entire kitchen i think is the best example of you know didi's architecture i would say and when you actually stand here and then everything is just within like 6 feet radius and uh, you know it's very functional and highly accessible uh, kitchen and everything you see they all have their own home and didi would sit like where i photographed it i'm sure didi would sit there and she would notice every single object and she would know if something has moved and that's her sense of observation she would always say even in uh, one of the basic design um, you know um, uh, design uh, one of the one of one of the times that you know we designed together she told me how it's very important to actually sit in a place and constantly observe and memorize a particular place and memorize a particular time because this is what will help us visualize and imagine a space and imagine a building um and also be able to understand and know okay when something has gone wrong and when somebody has gone like you know gone wrong from our drawing or something next slide please yeah so that's dd contractor for you guys uh so here um, she's yeah so i think it's very difficult to talk about dd without showing her everyday life and uh, in uh, if you want to connect vernacular houses to the house that she lived in and how we use the space her dining table was our working space or i would say our working space was her dining table so here you see there is an architect who is standing next to her and then you know working with her and she is constantly drawing and then in the middle the second photo she, you can see her cooking and i am assisting her cook so you know when we came to dd as um, architects uh, or as interns or how however you can call us we did not have a defined scope of work we did not have a we did not have a set of uh, you know work saying okay lakshmi tomorrow you're going to be drawing this okay you're going to be doing this we did not have that and every day in lakshmi you're muted can you hear me and, and lakshmi uh it's it's so engrossing but i think uh, you need to be a little faster yeah uh, i'll do that yeah i'll do that yeah I, I, i understand very emotionally involved no no i'll do that i'm sorry so you know the reason why i put this picture was that didi would say uh, you know vernacular is the mother of all languages and in fact didi was the vernacular for all her students i would say because she fed us with a motherly love she 
she took care of us she took care uh, she fed us intellectually emotionally like everything you name it and she was there and you know these pictures just describe and she is with her pet she is feeding a pet you know next picture yeah so this is an example of didi's drawing uh, this was done for radio station i think uh, anugnya was involved in this project uh, so this is how elaborate or how simple her drawing would be next slide yeah um again you know a series of sketches but very very consciously judiciously meticulously made drawings with clear cut explanation that none of us it it's very it's impossible to actually have doubts when she is explaining or when she is actually drawing next next slide and these are also some other drawings in the on the right side you actually see how she imagined uh, you know people a ch small child or a person sitting on the step or a person standing what they would see out of so these are some things that we constantly learn from dd you know to be consciously aware of uh, where we are in that particular moment and time what we are looking at how we are going to envision that space you know all these things are it was a part of our everyday life that it's become very 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 um, uh you know it's 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 so difficult to disassociate from that dd has imparted so many of her values uh that came out of respect that came out of learning uh into many of us that it's so it's it's impossible to disassociate from them next slide please yeah and these are some of the pictures of um, you know how she interacted with light uh, so um, you know this on the bottom left is a picture where it's facing the north side the window and then there is this blue color so we constantly have some kind of blue light or like light blue light and uh, above is a detail um, that chitra also showed of the nishta cleaning and she said you know so many she would so one of the things she she always advised us was to always carry a sketchbook wherever we go you know take down details notice the drawings notice i mean notice the details notice the building do this do that notice plus so many things so she would make a lot of notes and then she worked so hard on this uh, you know this grill pattern and then suddenly she remembered a detail that she saw uh, you know i think in um, Uh, Varanasi or something, and she was able to implement it, and she said it found it. It just felt so perfect over there. And um, this picture that I have made big over here on the right side is the southern window in Didi's home. Uh, not the southern window, the southeastern window in Didi's room. Next slide, please. And this is the kind of effect it gives, like most of the year. She just put a small crystal. um you know hanging from the middle of the window and because when the sun ray hits the crystal and then the there are like millions of rainbows in the room it's magic and that's one special character of dd's work is to actually create that element of surprise is to help con connect one person to light to the outside space to the neighboring space that that is a magic that she was able to create and this is this i think is something of you know ingenuity next slide please yeah um so these are some other pictures of her more recent um, buildings uh, she she built till uh, i think 2018 2018 or beginning of 2019 so these are some of her projects where she uses light again in vernacular architecture light was something very very important and uh, you know it was it's it was a part of the process of vernacular architecture so here dd actually gives uh, a different a new direction to usage of light to create drama she would always say architecture is a setting for a certain drama in a space to happen and just to actually think of it that way you know i think it's just mind blowing the way she would imagine light imagine the way it would flow imagine the way it would connect and also use it as a very intricate part of her design process next yeah this is a picture from dharmalaya i wanted to just show like you know one of her building uh, process next yeah and uh, this is didi from i think 1994 1995 standing in her southern uh, courtyard um outside our house and uh, you know so it's like you know it it this is uh, 
it's it's a lovely picture actually and uh, so she is right now before she she passed away so many things she i mean there are some things that she left unfinished and one of the things is to work on a book for young architects which is a culmination of a series of lectures and uh, you know series of lectures and talks that she has given so some of us uh, who have worked very closely with didi we are uh, you know we are taking that work forward and we want to finish that uh, and make it accessible to a lot of people and the uh, second thing i wanted to say before i finish was that didi was somebody you know who was a real mother she took uh, can you just stay in the last slide she took uh, real care in um, you know passing on she took real care in giving something to us to to anybody who came, who came across her and uh, before she died i think in the month of uh, may or june she told me she she gave me a message that you know wanted she wanted as an obituary message and in the end she said you know i actually don't want a lot of focus on my work but i want a lot of focus on everyone's work who has taken the ideology that i believed in and who is you know who are taking it forward in their own region and in their own direction that's why i think anumya presenting now would be you know uh, ideal in explaining about her work in pune and uh, the third thing that i wanted to say is that uh, you know one of the last few days before she died uh, didi called me in and then she said lakshmi i feel so bad i said why i said she said i feel so bad that i'm not able to pass on anything architecturally to you anymore i said didi but you've done enough for me you know and i think you've done enough for all of us that we can all um have our own identity and like work together and she's and i told her that but i think i'm learning how to be a human being and she said this she said in order to be a good architect you need to be a very good human being and i think that's one important lesson i have learned from didi and um, right now didi is not a person anymore but she's a principal she told me that uh, you know guru is not a person but it's a principle that you will carry forward you know that you will remember and carry forward so i wish and hope you know whatever didi believed in however her approach to architecture was we would be able to consider her as a uh, you know a principle a guiding principle in all the work that we do not only architecture but we the way we actually live every day thank you so much and thank you for all your patience and i think i got <laughs> thank you anugya and we don't have time but <laughs> you could um, so uh, it's it's good to hear everyone and um but when i met didi i had had 5 years of architectural education and i had had 3 years of uh, work working experience in commercial offices and i knew that i don't know anything about building and i was desperately searching for someone who could actually teach me how to build because i knew that unless i learn how to build i cannot design and whatever i had been doing all those years was uh not helping me to sort of stay on my course and uh, really be sure that i want to practice architecture and why do i want to practice architecture and so with a lot of questions and a lot of desperation and anger uh, i left for himachal and when i met didi until then i had always heard that women don't build and uh, mud walls don't stand and uh, masons are masons and architects are architects and architects are you know above all and i, I met didi and uh, i i had a feeling that all of these things that i was told were were not true but i was always told that there is no alternative you know this is how things are this is how things should be and it was one person who challenged all of that she also challenged the age factor and uh, the gender factor and the factor that you need industrial materials to build something beautiful and that uh, masons had to be masons and architects had to be architects and she was the first person who said to us that if you want to be an architect please be a mason first please be a carpenter be uh, like all kinds of trades in construction and that would probably make you a good architect you know just good 
good that's it and uh, it it was good to get that kind of a permission from someone like dd to hear that uh, all these things that uh, were uh, given to me as conventions could be challenged and there is a way of challenging it and there is a way of uh, finding alternatives for it and the whole ethical and philosophical belief that i had somewhere she gave a voice to it that's that's the most important uh, gift she gave me i would say and um she just didn't show us how to build she showed us how to uh, use architecture as our voice to uh, question things and to give alternatives to things not just architecturally but uh, you know even to social things and uh, educational issues and um, a lot of other environmental issues that architecture has the um ability and strength and power to uh, sort of get into all of these other fields of life and uh, make small changes so uh, as my first assignment uh, she sent me to this place uh, so she sent me here this is gadwal and she told me to build this this is the radio station that lakshmi showed you the drawing of this is mandakini ki awaz a community radio station which was uh, established there uh, by people's power collective from bangalore and this was that uh, perfect project that uh, sort of um, gave me the all the answers and a few more questions to uh, sort of go on with and um, this this sort of helped me to see architecture as truly vernacular as something that evolves in time that that's something that uh, changes with people and grows and it is dynamic and uh, living you know so um this this whole building although was uh, designed by dd and it was all built as per her instructions and uh, guidance uh, it still had uh, sort of elements that were purely gadwali this this uh, stone masonry that beautiful stone masonry that uh, we see uh, at this radio station uh, that's a very gadwali element and um, most of the times now that uh, a lot of cement plaster has reached but they have started covering it up with cement plaster and nobody looks at that as beautiful anymore so this radio station was one place that started flaunting it celebrating it and these small hand skills that were slowly uh diminishing in that region or had lost their respect and relevance were suddenly something to celebrate and to look at and to engage with so um that showed me what she meant by vernacular not not something that's frozen in time any tradition is not frozen in time any tradition is something that people make out of it as the time changes and that's that's something dd uh, sort of taught us all to uh figure out um so these are some internal pictures of the radio station where the furniture where the building the stone the mud everything came from the site itself and it everything was built by local people and in that sense it was very much their own radio station you know all the material came from their backyards also so um it, it the building in itself had the essence of community and hence the radio station becomes like a place uh that is a perfect fit for uh this small studio that we have and in terms of um like the technical uh requirements of a broadcasting studio mud walls work perfectly and uh, otherwise it would have required a lot of uh, industrial insulation materials and which were very expensive and the transport uh, of that to gadwal would have been very expensive but just her rice us mud plaster was all the acoustic treatment we needed for the studio and it functioned uh, perfectly well without any imported uh, material uh, even for lamp shades and smaller interior details of this building uh, a lot of local gadwali craft like ringal was used which is the kind of uh, dynamic uh, vernacular that ed often talks about it's not there in himachal but we were not 
copy pasting buildings in himachal into gadwal just because it's another hill you know we were actually considering what happens in gadwal and trying to incorporate that into the building there so that uh, sort of was extremely uh, enriching at the same time exhausting mentally emotionally and on all fronts exhausting experience for me and i remember going back to sidbadi after finishing this radio station and i just sat in that dining area that lakshmi showed you in front of dd and her cat pulke jumped into my lap and i was just stroking pulke and i was just sitting there crying without talking for a very long time and she let me have that emotion she held me in that emotion she let me speak you know and that was kind of the turning point i would say for me and i'm sure all of her interns have these points in these house somewhere where suddenly all of their um, limiting assumptions in their past life suddenly fall apart and and they change and it's an irreversible change you can't go back to being blind you know you you start seeing things and you start seeing the reason and you can't go back from that that's 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 dd's biggest gift to all of us interns so uh, in that same kitchen uh, i was as usual making some maharashtrian breakfast for dd and she was talking to some eminent guests who often sit in that living area and she was telling them that it's time to uh, push her out of the nest and i was really scared and shocked and hurt and i was like wondering what she's talking about and she turned to me i with this like that dazzling child like smile and she said that you're ready to fly you're going to be pushed out so she pushed me out and the radio station and that that time with dd uh, ha- had done something to me that i can't explain and that i can't uh, put in words but she knew when it was time and she uh, told me to sort of start taking up work start exploring things and start doing things on my own and um so I- i'll also show you briefly some pictures of uh, my work that i did after uh, sort of uh, starting on my own the reason to show these pictures is just to say that ha- how uh, we we got the tools from dd to build in any area and how we sort of go on uh, working with it and we still find her voice in our head you know guiding the design and guiding how we uh, approach the things and uh, we may not be able to do it to that perfection but it's good to have a guiding voice in our heads you know it, it's something that's very essential to have for making any kind of right ethical philosophically appropriate decisions in life so i am really glad that dd's voice is that voice in my head that tells me right from wrong and that tells me to do better and that tells me that uh, we can do something more with it and we can do just enough also so this is uh, a house i have uh, built in coastal maharashtra i'll run through the pictures i will not stop and explain a lot but i hope you all see a little bit of dd in this also because this is not a copy and this is not an adaptation of her work this is something that uh, she sort of so so did me she put yes. that seed inside and and this is just what happens when she does that to you so um the small details of how how light should come and how doors and windows should be designed how to use like the, the leftover material to make shelvings and to make uh, smaller elements in the house and all of those things are something we directly picked up from dd apart from these uh, philosophical and ethical things that have uh, unknowingly entered our uh, work and life ethic um uh, yeah these small details were something that a lot of artisans started coming up with on their own because this was the style of building that they knew and this was the style of building that was there in their blood you know so once we start uh, using mud and once we start using wood 
the carpenters start uh, coming up with this sample of a bolt and sample of a handle that they made by hand and that's probably one of the most rewarding experiences in um uh, building with communities and building with natural materials that that the barrier between the mason and architect the barrier between the carpenter and architect it starts falling apart and you start becoming a team and they become your friends and they actually literally become your family also someday but uh, so so these are the things that um are not acceptable in conventional architecture your life is very compartmentalized and and these materials and working uh, with the philosophy that dd gave us doesn't allow you to do that your your life becomes uh, a harmonious thing your life becomes starts dropping out all the contradictions and compartments and and you start seeing things in a new light um so this was one drawing that we made for this client it's in marathi because the carpenter understands marathi and the drawing is also for the client who was working hands on so he will understand how his kitchen is going to be arranged and we had so much fun making these drawings and we had so much fun making these objects on site and and this is not how architectural drawings are meant to look like but this works and this makes sense and this is how we should work i i i think so that was the drawing and this was the uh, shelf that was put into the kitchen uh, these small details like this where uh, we can you know sculpt furniture around people's anatomy you know which is a concept that uh, often times modern architecture seems to forget because i remember learning to design high rise buildings um with the basic unit the as 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 the car parking and 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 even then i thought that is that what we measure architecture on like how big your car is whereas i have seen that in this style of building the architecture is molding itself around a human body which is the most beautiful thing to exist ever in the world you know so these small details where the there is space for your toes and there is uh, like the building and the space is uh, sort of molding around you that that experience of urban building was something that was so uh, energizing to have with dd and to carry it forward so the seating windows dd is favorite uh, things uh this is the overall view of the house and uh, uh, the concept of open kitchen was kind of new for the village but uh, it, it is ended up becoming a community space although it was designed for a family of three people and all the village kids come and sit here on the staircases to read books and to study and and it's it's so um sort of rewarding and heartwarming experience to see those pictures and hear from the clients how how the whole village comes and hangs around this house and i am really grateful to dd to have touched our lives in that way so uh this is a modern residence in in pune and uh, it's in a city and it's in a center of the city and where the space crunch is there and there are there are so many restrictions and uh, a lot of other uh barriers to build with natural materials but um it somehow happened that we ended up building a mud house right in the heart of the city and uh it, it gave a lot of joy to us and sharing these updates with dd gave i hope a lot of joy to dd that's what i heard so uh, i i thought i'll share a few pictures of this house also and this is very modern and very urban house but it's still uh has the same uh, spirit that uh, dd uh, gave us and to the buildings so the door and window designs is one of the assignments that dd uh, gives all of her uh in turns and uh it, it looks like initially when a person is not prepared for it very um simple assignment and then as dd uh, tells you the 
rules of the game it becomes really complicated and challenging and adventurous and it, it's it's like a exciting thing for uh, all of us who've been trained by dd to design doors and windows to do that and uh, i'm really happy that dd loved these windows the skylight details and everything although they are based on dd's work uh, there is so much that you have to do on site that's that's your own that um, it's it's an adventure to uh, have so the um, roofing also the see the soon as you change the material the entire roofing system your details how you would uh, Uh, you know transfer weight from one element to the other and the whole structural system changes drastically so the kind of bamboo we have in himachal is hameltoni uh, locally called as mugger which is a huge fat bamboo with very thin walls so you can do different kind of details with it but the kind of bamboo we have in maharashtra is a uh, very thin and a uh, very much solid more solid i mean thick walled than uh, hameltoni so with with that kind of bamboo you have to come up with different details different ways of joinery and different ways of using it and so basically um, dd teaches you to learn the structure and aesthetics together so every element she uses in her roof or in her building has uh, a structural role and it also has an aesthetic role right so so once you learn the um, how how the interdependence which she loves explaining um that that's when you start learning that every element in that building uh has a context of its own climate and where it comes from so when you change the context and when you change the climate and you have a completely different material they have the same roles but they play differently so you have to work with that change in their role and that's that's really beautiful so with mugger you can do this what our dear jeetpal mason is doing here is uh making a uh, chachra which is like opening up the bamboo to make a sort of mat which is used as lost form work in dd's roof so uh you can do that with a bamboo that has a very big girth which is very big in size but at the same time very thin walled you can't do that with the bamboo that we have in maharashtra but you can do this so this is what we used as uh, the lost form work for our roofs and and now uh, standing under that space and looking up at the roof uh, and sending dd the picture pictures of that roof was was so much joy that we both felt together same thing with bamboo joinery uh, so the way mugger is uh, joined together uh, with other bamboos and with wood is very different you can't do the same thing with this bamboo which is very thin but very solid right so instead of putting the nails through the bamboo uh, our carpenters started putting the nails onto sides and turning them in onto the bamboo so as to hook it in and it's very solid uh, it probably doesn't look like it but it's an extremely solid way of joining bamboo without damaging the bamboo and all of these things are organically coming up on site there is nobody who uh, gave instructions for that and nobody received instructions for that people just sat together having tea and came up with these things and started doing it that that was as informal as that okay uh, this picture is uh, of my wedding and it was taken on my construction site and it just made the whole event and ceremony incredibly uh, different for both of us and just to mention i met my husband and my family and hence my family uh, while we were doing the radio station together so that's what i meant by not having those barriers of you know work and life because you meet people who are like minded who want to walk the same walk with you that that's when it's possible to break those barriers and have the same ethical stand have the same philosophical stand to base your personal life as well as your work life on which is which is an incredible learning that comes from dd um uh, this is a uh, a sample of um uh, uh, oiling the floor that uh, dd and i used to discuss a lot and it was so exciting to do a sample on site that i had to share the picture with you guys and i think it 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 just looks beautiful the it's the kind of beauty that most of us have forgotten to look at you know um uh,
yeah hello so it's the kind of beauty that most of us have forgotten how to uh, look at because everything is so shiny and finished and straight lines and smooth finishes that that this texture of mud flooring with the uh, oiled uh, uh, what you can say finish is something that i have seen a lot of people take time to warm up to whereas when when we see it because of the way dd has changed us all uh it, it's it's so beautiful and it's so exciting for all of us and that's i think something that um uh, gives me hope and gives me a reason to carry on what uh dd has uh, sort of given us so uh one analogy that dd used to always love is that of a buddhist prayer wheel you know i hope you all have seen those those are like cylindrical things that gently rotate so um uh, she used to always say that you should be able to have the right restraint of doing just enough you know just giving that enough nudge to keep the prayer wheel moving because you can drag the prayer wheel you can you know grab it and like move around but that's not prayer and um, most of the design uh, discipline that uh, most of us come from uh, is like that rigid overdoing everything you know if you if you want to do better you have to do a lot or too much of it and she she taught us to use that restraint she taught us that learn to do just enough to keep the things going you know that that's not lazy it's in fact the most difficult thing to do i've seen that that doing just enough to know where to stop and uh, where to hold back is is very difficult but she also uses this metaphor to uh, give hope she says that uh, you have to just give that nudge and move on and hope and know in your heart that someone else is going to come into that so when it comes to using architecture as a movement that she was or is it's like a prayer wheel you know she she nudged us and we started moving and we have to nudge and there are going to be a lot of people moving and and we all become this big voice of saying that yes women can build yes old women can build and yes mud walls stand and and yes there is no difference between a mason and architect they are all just uh, you know and these big things that dd has sort of uh, left us has huge precious inheritance it is what um, makes her in a way immortal i am still not able to um, process the fact that she is actually not there because for me she is still there she is there somewhere in her house uh, sitting uh, having her supper or by now watching something on her computer and and she's there and when i will meet reach a point where i i need to make a decision i i know her voice will be there in my head and i know it will guide me to do the right thing and she is there you know so i i hope you see her and hear her too thank you thank you that's fantastic i just wanted to thank this person anujana because i think i can see what diti must have been and uh, i'm sorry to bhajan most but, welcome sir <laughs> but all these youngsters you know who have worked with her is to my mind a new generation of inspiration for our profession and uh, there could be nothing better than that you see because i don't see these youngsters as architects i see them as human beings you know their work reflects you know themselves i mean they are so honest and i wonder how many architects today who are running big firms do this service to the profession and in that sense i think what didi has left for us is something to cherish forever in terms of these youngsters i think you all are you know our future i don't know uh 
is there any time for any more discussion? I think she had the last word in a sense, uh, and sir has summed up so well. Is there any really pressing question? Otherwise, I think we have to call. Uh, you know, I mean, a lot has been, of course, said about Didi, and it's a huge inspiration. I had met her a couple of times, and I've seen some of her work. But I want to sort of steer this discussion a little bit more, uh, which is more relevant to this series, which is basically style. And of course, there's no doubt that she has created her own style, which really makes us really think. The styles could be created by contemporary architects, which we can be inspired. But you know, one thing really struck me was the kind of uh, uh, the kind of uh, style she's actually perhaps uh, being influenced by the Pueblo style of uh, jog or meme, uh, which she's really bringing it and really taking it to a new level. Uh, in India, and which is very interesting that, you know, uh, sort of these influences that are coming from outside and uh, are being indigenized. So, I mean, there's no particular style we can call it. We can name it as DD style. But uh, it's interesting to see how uh, these uh, uh, influences perhaps she had in her earlier life she was able to really use it and the confidence she had with mud perhaps had her uh, roots in her um, uh, upbringing in New Mexico, uh, which was perhaps almost the same time that uh, Meme was very, very active there. And he was reviving this all, all this urban architecture in New Mexico and Texas. So, I mean, though I, though I did say that style is not uh, historically maybe uh, independent, but yet you do see styles to have several historical uh, connections. So I just wanted to say that to, so that it also brings uh, relevance to our study of style, the, the, this whole works of her. Thank you. Uh, can I can I add to that if I be? Sure, sure. Um, so you know, Didi, Didi always uh, disapproved of calling any of her buildings, you know, Didi style or Didi signature. Definitely, a lot of uh, you know she has been influenced by uh, you know the Pablos in uh, Taos in New Mexico. But more than her style being aesthetic, I think it's her approach towards architecture, which pays respect to the tradition, which pays respect to the place, which um, which uh, adds value to the place. Um, you know, all these things and her concern about the environment, the world around, um, and her concern about every sentient being. I think this approach is what is common in all of her buildings. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. We are too used to I mean, uh, looking at buildings as objects. Often, <laughs> where rarely one stands in front of a building and imagines either has information or engagement or imagines how it has come come about. And uh, that, that we cannot do, or can't afford to do. And one starts doing that, it may be a little different story in any case. To, Right. Uh, Katie, sir, thank you very much for getting it together. Now, you want to say something at this moment? Because I think they're not very, very important questions as such. Uh, then I can tell Malvika to wrap it up. Well, uh, I only want to say that it was an excellent session. I think we covered an entire range of uh, aspects of Jimmy's work. And most importantly, uh, we saw from the larger philosophical perspective and her, the underpinnings of her ethical position, uh, we are moving on to the sheer materiality and how she dealt with materials. So I think that that entire range came through in the presentations, except that 
I don't think we managed time too well. But apart from that, I think it has been a wonderful session. And I thank every one of you. I don't know how to thank all of you for uh, having done what you have done. You've spoken from your heart. You've, you've spoken what you felt. And that, I think, is so much like Didi. She, she didn't mince words. She spoke straight. She thought straight. And she had a position <clears throat> which was non, a non-compromising, ethically non-compromising position about everything. And I think that came through very well. And uh, what is most important to me uh, than uh, the appearance of a building, appearance in her opinion was only a symptom. It's symptomatic of a certain kind of process. It's symptomatic of a certain set of relationships that she was able to build around the building process. Relationship between people, uh, nature, land, water, skills, traditions, materials. She was able to connect these things in a way to give rise to a certain method of building. Apart from having a kind of a, a rough sort of a plan and a section, uh, everything else actually the building comes into being from the context. I think that's that was the most important part about Didi's work. And that context was defined by her not merely from what was happening just on the land there at that moment, but it was defined by her uh, from a larger understanding of the processes uh, in the world where a kind of unbridled growth that has finally resulted in the kind of destructions that we see. And that destruction is far more visible in the countryside than in cities, because in countryside, Fragile natural systems are destroyed every day, every day by the construction. And I think she stood against that process. And her, her work is actually architecture's voice of dissent against this wanton destruction of nature and literal suicide that we are leading ourselves to. I think it was her way of protesting by building. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you, Mark. It was fabulous. What you spoke was fabulous. Uh, I don't see Devan anymore. Devan is. I think I think he left. He had a meeting. All right. So thank you, Lakshmi. Thank you, Anitna. And thank you, Mr. Naresh. It was fabulous. I think it was a wonderful session. Great learning for me as well. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. It was good to connect with everybody. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank everybody once more. So uh, just don't leave us yet. Give us a couple of more minutes, please. I know we are running very late. Um, but you know, uh, with so many speakers who spoke from the heart, like Katie sir said, it was uh, evident that we would run out of time. So um, just hear me out for a couple of minutes. Sorry, I'm Malvika from Intac. Um, you know, on behalf of Intac, I want to really thank each of the speakers uh, because you shared your rich experience with uh, Didi. And uh, you know, for most of you who were closely associated with her, it would be a tough and emotional time. But yet you took out the time for this and made the effort and shared with us. Um, and on behalf of Architectural Heritage Division Intact, uh, I uh, express thanks to Chairman Sir and Member Secretary Intact for supporting such seminal research projects because of which we can have such uh, a dissemination and uh, events that uh, give us liberty uh, to, to uh, incorporate them in, in our research work. Um, and we were very happy to have an overwhelming response for registrations. Thank you all who um, patiently sat through the initial glitches of uh, Facebook, and I apologize for that. Um, but uh, we will edit the recordings and uh, have the videos uploaded online for those of you who missed initially and those of you who want to look at this again. Um, and uh, also, um, in my list, I have uh, thanks for Brinda Kanvinde and Pinaki Roy from Forum for Responsible Building. Uh, thank you so much for allowing us to play the film on DD, which was shown in public for the first time. 
uh, we will have it in our recording online uh, for those of you experience glitches during that. Um, and uh, we have an advisory committee for architecture and heritage in, uh, at Intact. And Professor Katie Ravindran is the chairperson of that. And thank you so much to the committee and sir to you for always encouraging us. And so you literally just put this together and let us handle it. Uh, thank you, sir. And uh, in this process, we are also fortunate to learn so much about Didi's work and philosophy for a better world. And um, I think it's a great documentation, like Rajit sir told me. Uh, for, uh, this recording will inspire many, many more later who have not seen it yet. Um, and uh, Mr. Dilip Gupta, who just spoke before us, uh, uh, he's the principal director for architectural heritage. Um, we highly appreciate his vision and uh, giving us a free hand to ideate and organize such relevant events within the ambit of our research work. Uh, and most of all, to Shah Ragrawal and Alia Reiki, who are the architects at Intact with us, who have uh, worked round the clock to ensure that this tribute works out as seamless as possible. Um, we, Always, uh, such things have way of uh, a way of coming up with glitches. But thank you both for helping us organize it at short notice, taking care of all things big and small. And uh, most of all, thank you for the participants uh, and encouraging us. And we will keep you posted if we organize more events. And uh, Rajat sir, thank you so much for always being our intellectual guide uh, as a research advisor and being accessible and makingly moderating this discussion. Thank you all. And uh, if you have any last words, Kibet, uh, Kibet, sir, please take it from here. That's from me. Thank you.